That was beautiful. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn to the Gospel of Mark, the second chapter? Gospel of Mark, second chapter. We've been looking in Jonah for uh, the last four weeks, and we saw a reluctant prophet. We're going to see the exact opposite today. We're going to see four friends who had a burden for a man to be sure that that man made his way to Jesus. So we're going to look at that in just a moment. Mark chapter 2. We'll begin reading in a few moments from verse 1 and go through verse 12. You know, as I was preparing this week for uh, the message, I was really contemplating some of the figures, some of the persons in the Bible who demonstrated great perseverance and determination. Uh, First one I thought of from the Old Testament was Noah. And I checked with scholars, one of which is John Parker, who's here Um, but uh, Noah spent somewhere between 55 and 75 years building the ark. Now that that takes a lot of determination and stick-to-itiveness. I thought of Nehemiah. He completed the wall in 52 days, uh, even though it was a much shorter period than Noah. Nehemiah stuck to the task in the midst of opposition from those men, Sambalat and Tobiah, who were trying to taunt him and the people. Then I thought about Caleb. Uh, Caleb, as a young man, uh, was one of two uh, persons among the spies who went into the land who brought back a faithful and a favorable report. And then the people wandered for 40 years, that generation, except for Caleb himself uh, and Joshua uh, uh, passed on. Joshua and Caleb were able to go into the land. When they went into the land, Caleb said, uh, give me the toughest land. Give me the land where the giants are. And so he went in and conquered uh, Hebron as an octogenarian, 80 years old. I thought in the New Testament, uh, Anna. Anna's a great story. And we read about her right after the birth account of Jesus, uh, some eight days after Jesus was born and was taken to the temple area to be circumcised in accordance with Jewish law. And Anna was there, and she was an individual, the scripture said, who had waited for this and had prayed and fasted day and night for many, many days. And Simeon, along with her, had waited so many years for it to happen, and he waited until the Messiah arrived, and he offered what's known as the Nunc Dementis, now I may depart. In other words, I was waiting, and I was waiting, I persevered, and now I've seen the Lord's Messiah. But But yet, the greatest example is Jesus himself. Think about Christ. It tells us in Philippians 2 that he became obedient even to the point of death. He went fully. He persevered. And uh, and he he had a determination to accomplish the the purpose the Father had for him. Well, today we're going to look at four people, not as notorious as any of those that I just mentioned, Nonetheless, these four, in fact, we might qualify by saying all five, demonstrated a great determination and perseverance as they sought to get this man to Jesus. Look with me, Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It said, when he, that is Jesus, entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together, there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Join with me in prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and Lord, would that we have the same burden, the same conviction, the same determination that these five individuals had. Lord, as we prepare this week to go in this area into a time of evangelistic services, Lord, uh, we pray that you would give us a burden to pray, to invite, and to, Lord, uh, just desire to see you do a great work in this community. And so, Lord, we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In our text this morning, we see that Jesus uh, has just left the greater Galilee area, and he approached specifically the city of Capernaum. It's very easy to remember where Capernaum is. You think of a cap. The uh, Capernaum was a city that was located at the cap or just above the Sea of Galilee. We see and read later in this that it was a, a headquarters of ministry uh, for Jesus, one of many headquarters he would have. But when he was in the area, the home in which he stayed uh, was the Apostle Peter's. And so word had spread uh, that Jesus was doing uh, great works. And so we see here that Jesus was teaching, but many people were coming because they knew that he was a great miracle worker. And it was such a great crowd uh, that we see uh, there was sort of SRO, standing room only. And, and so we see here that the ministry was carried out. The venue was not this large facility that we'll look at tonight, uh, here in Farmville area, uh, but he was meeting in the home. It, it was at home, it said, and it was uh, home to him there. It was sort of a home away from home for him. It was Peter's home. He was welcome there. And so Jesus, uh, uh, coming from the great area of Galilee, came to this area and thought he would uh, just uh, be there for a while. And so he taught, and great crowds began to come. There were people who were curious, maybe who had heard about Jesus, others who had seen and heard him before. Uh, but it was so packed, it would be like sardines in a sardine can. Let's put it this way. It was a good thing the fire marshal weren't around in those days because they would have had a problem. And so all of these people were in attendance. But among all of the crowd, we see that Mark chooses to mention five individuals among this great throng of people. And these five individuals had a great determination. They would be unimpeded and be ensured that this man who was lame, would get to Jesus. So in this text, we see faith and resolve. We see determination. Four men bringing their friend to Jesus Christ. And so if they could only get him before Jesus. I wonder if we had that type of burden for our friends, for our co-workers. If it would be like, God, could, could it just be? Can, can it just be that we can get this one, Lord to you. Well, I, I want to look at the determination of these men, but before uh, we do that, there are a few things I think that are important to note. The first, the situation. Many people were gathered. Uh, it was very difficult to get into this uh, particular area. And so these five men specifically, their situation was this. They were on the outside looking in at the beginning. But not only do we see the situation, we see the opposition. It's very interesting. These who wanted to get toward Jesus uh, had a very difficult time. But we see that the scribes, the religious leaders who were set against Jesus, they were sitting within eye distance of Jesus because he looked out. He could tell that they were questioning in their hearts, why does Jesus speak like this? He's blaspheming. Now, Jesus could understand what they were saying, but my idea also is this, as I began to read this, is he probably saw this sarcastic look in these individuals who were set against him. And so Jesus, greater than they were, more authoritative than they were, he said, I I'm going to prove to you. He said, which is easier, to forgive sins or to heal a sick? Now, let's be honest. Really, it's harder to forgive sins because only God can do that, man can't do that even as an instrumentation we might be a messenger but we can't through us provide salvation only God so really uh, it's harder to forgive sins but in visual evidence it would be more difficult to heal someone because someone could say well I forgive sin and there'd be no outward evidence of that but if someone said you he you're healed then there would be visual evidence so Jesus said so that I prove to you I can do the greater thing let me do something that is more visual for you to see to prove that I can do it he told the man to get up 
and to take his mat and walk. And then we see that other declaration that's so important today. Not only was this man physically healed, but he said, son, your sins are forgiven. The greatest need in the world today, the greatest need in our community today is that people's sins be forgiven, that they be made new in Christ. It, it tells us in Corinthians that if any person be in Christ is a new creation, all things have passed away. All things become new. What people need is a new creation. And when, fam when individuals are changed, families are changed, schools are changed, communities are changed, there's power in the gospel message. And so while the healings are great and so important to verify the ministry of Jesus, let us make no mistake, the greatest intent in ministry of Jesus is the forgiveness of sin. So we could spend an entire message on all of these points, the situation, uh, the declaration, the opposition. But I want to look today specifically at these five men and look at the subject of determination. In the spirit of a Noah and a Caleb and a Jesus, we see that these men were undeterred in their pursuit of Jesus. This week, I just wanted to look up that word determination and it's very interesting. There are two primary uses of the word determination in the English language. The first definition is this, firmness of purpose and resoluteness. In other words, uh, if I'm determined to do something, I am going to be firm in that resolve. I'm going to do it. But there's also another definition for determination, and it's this, the process of establishing something exactly by calculation or research. So you may make a determination about something based on facts. So one speaks sort of to our attitude, we're gonna be determined. The other speaks sort of to our intellect that we're gonna determine something based on the facts of something. We'll look at that in just a moment. But here we see that first they determined that Jesus was this man's only hope, that calculation. But then they determined from the will, the desire of the heart, that they would do everything they could to get this man to Jesus. And so I want to note four things this morning. And each of these has to do with this theme of determination. And the first is this. The five men came to a determination that this paralytic needed help. I say five because the paralytic was in this group. Now, he could not physically walk. He didn't have the physical ability to get himself to Jesus, but he complied with the efforts of his four friends. He cooperated with them. He did not resist this. Now, remember, we just noted that one of the main definitions of this word determination is something that is, is speaking to a calculation or research or a understanding intellectually of something. For instance... We may make the determination that sometime between 7 o'clock and 7.30 to evening is going to be sunset. But we make that as not just some random wish, but we make it based on the fact of the matter. We may read the almanac and it will say, this is when the sun is going to set. We may say, well, last night it set uh, at such and such time and it's going to be one or two minutes earlier tonight. So we make a determination of what will happen based on our research, based on the facts. And so here we see that these men came to a term determination that this man needed help. In, in intellectual understanding, he needed help. Uh, now, this is simple. I mean, when we look at someone uh, that is limited in that way, we would say, well, it doesn't take rocket science uh, to understand they need help. Even though it's simple, though, it's essential. All was not well with this man. Uh, he could not move freely on his own. Friends who observed him noticed his limitations. And so we see that it's very simple. This man needed physical healing, and they understood that they needed to get that help. You know, sometimes we can make a determination of someone's need readily. 
For instance, if we were to see someone walking in the building with a seeing eye dog, we would make the determination that they can't see. Or if someone hobbles in, we'll say, well, maybe that person's injured an ankle or injured a hip or a knee. Those things we can readily deduce, we can determine based on things that we see outwardly. But there are other needs that we do not see, not in the physical eyes, but in the spiritual eyes. For instance, uh, if someone does not know Jesus Christ, it's very rare for someone like that to walk in here, it can happen, but not often, and say, I need Jesus, I'm not saved, someone tell me how to do it. Often those needs, those spiritual needs, are inward and spiritual needs that are spiritually discerned. And so as we look at this, it was very easy for these men to see the physical need and they had the intent to bring him to get the physical healing. But we see that Jesus healed this man spiritually. That wasn't readily seen, but the men at least brought him to Jesus. Let me show you uh, through a personal illustration that the difference in, in these needs that are, are very prevalent and obvious and others that are not. Uh, many of you have met Ben Lehman who mentored me in personal evangelism. I'm grateful for him. He still keeps in touch with me and I hope to have him come back sometime next year. But when he was discipling me in personal evangelism, we would uh, travel from, from home to home in the city of Fort Worth. And Ben is one of the most gifted evangelists I ever met. He had churches there were attendants of 2,000 and 3,000 that were going to pay him to be their evangelism uh, minister. You know what Ben said, if you know him, he said, I'm not getting paid to do what God's called me to do. Forget those people. In fact, he left the church. They wanted him to do it because he said they got it all wrong. They're about numbers. Well, so one evening we were visiting and, and he was modeling evangelism for me and we knocked on the door. I was in my early 20s and, and uh, uh, this lady answered the door and we looked back in the apartment and there was this tall, imposing figure. He was six feet, six inches tall. But as we arrived, we noticed that he had one limb removed above the knee. And this was a young man in maybe his late 20s, early 30s. He had gotten cancer and they had to remove his leg. And so as we were there and we were talking, as the four of us, Ben and I and uh, the, the couple, uh, I would just, my heart began to go out to this guy because he looked about my age and he was going through that and I was looking at that physical need. All of a sudden I realized that Ben, and we were all in the same room, began to witness to the wife. And, and he led the wife to the Lord. And, and as we did, you know, we'll debrief and we talk about afterward. And, and I, I said, Ben, I was so focused on that guy and the outward need. He said, but Rick, I just felt in my heart a discernment that the spiritual need was the wife. You see, we've got to be tuned in to God. We, knew, we need to, to be sensitive to the spiritual needs uh, that are around us. And so the five men, uh, in a very good way, determined uh, that their friend had a need. But I want you to see um, a second truth. The men came to another determination and understanding, a reasoning, that Jesus was the only one who could help. We don't know a lot about uh, this man's story. Uh, this story is included in the three synoptic gospels. It's not in John's gospels, but the other three, it's included. And none of them mention whether this man was born a paralytic or became one uh, through life situation. We don't know very much about anything that happened before this. Had he sought other cures? Had he pursued other avenues? We don't know. It doesn't say. I would imagine he had, and that, that's just an assumption. But what we do know is this. At this point in his life, these four friends and this man knew that Jesus was the only hope. I love these four friends here in Mark chapter 2. They were burdened about their friends. It wasn't enough for them to see the need. They were burdened. They were moved. And I'm just as impressed that they believed on Jesus to be able to produce what was needed. You see, it's one thing to know there's a need. It's another thing to know how to resolve that need. 
Let me illustrate it to you this way. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a little over a week ago, I was stopping to get gas in Farmville. As I pulled up, I noticed a lady, the hood was up on her car. It was hot. Uh, the radiator, she was pouring water into it. And uh, she was saying, can you help me? I said, lady, you don't know me. I can't help you one bit. Uh, I do know this. When I was 24 years old or 25, I poured uh, cold water in a hot radiator, and that isn't a brilliant thing to do, all right? That's all I told her, but I didn't know anything. But here I was. Here was a need I felt for. I, I felt compassion. I wanted to help her. I, I looked around. I didn't know anybody. I knew Sean was working, and so I couldn't say, Sean, could you come over here? And so I just had to get in my car and leave. Now, I, I prayed that, you know, Lord, help her, but I could not meet that need. You know, it's one thing to see a need. It's one thing to perceive a need. It's another thing to say, let me take you to the one. Let me show you how that need is met. You see, these men had a determination that Jesus was the answer. We know who can help. As we go into this series of, of meetings this week, and we're going to see lots of people in the building, more than we see in this area, uh, probably other than for a few sporting events. Uh, we, we, many of us who are believers, uh, we'll be there. And we say, we may not know people, but we can be in a spirit of prayer. Lord Jesus, help that person to see. Help that person to understand. We can be the vehicle that can point people to Jesus. Why don't we do it more often? I was thinking about that this week. It could be indifference that we really don't care enough about people. We're so busy, and we can be busy, we don't care. But I think maybe more than indifference would be unbelief. We really don't believe Jesus can meet the spiritual need. We really don't believe that Jesus is the answer. You say, well, why can you say that? Well, we might believe it up here, but we believe it here. Do we really believe it? Because so many times we're rationalized. We want to witness to somebody and fear sets in. What will they think of me? Will they reject? Will I offend them? See, we're thinking on the horizontal level there. We're not thinking on the vertical level. We're not thinking about God. We're, we're thinking about all of these things, and our eyes are off Jesus. And what happens when our eyes are, are moved from Jesus? Now we begin to look at the obstacles rather than looking in faith. So by unbelief, I'm not saying we're not saved. But I said many times we as Christians, when we get our eyes on the situation we're not understanding that God is orchestrating and working then we begin to take our eyes off of Jesus and through unbelief we stop short or we don't even begin to do that and so we see here the beautiful thing of these two individuals or these four individuals and the fifth one they understood that there was a need but secondly they also determined that Jesus was the one who could help. But I want you to see a third thing. They came to the determination to develop a plan to get the man to Jesus. They came up with a plan. Helping this man was such a driving force that they developed an inordinate plan. With the crowds blocking the door, they decided to go on the roof. Now, their roofs are different. There weren't A-frames. There weren't, it was flat roofs in that particular culture. In fact, we mentioned Cornelius and Peter. Peter went up on the roof to pray. People would go up. Uh, if you've been in third world countries, you've been, a lot of times they'll set barrels up there to collect water on the roof. Some people go up to meditate on the roof. It can be uh, sort of a, a man's cave in the outside in this particular culture. And so the, the roofs were used for many things. But in this case, they decided to climb up the ladder, cut through the thatch in the tile, and let the man down. I was uh, uh, amused when I was reading what one commentator said. Could you imagine how the people felt when part of the roof was falling in on them? They probably weren't too happy. But these men didn't care about that. They wanted to bring the friend to the Lord. And so it demanded forethought. It demanded extra effort. And if you and I are going to bring people to Jesus... We've got to plan to do it. We've got to expect to do it. We've got to pray. We've got to invite. Some people don't come because they're not invited. We've got to share testimony. We've got to share the gospel. All of these call for effort on the behalf of the believer. I thought in my own life and conviction set in. What are the things that I plan? I plan my vacations. I plan my retirement. 
I plan my monthly budget. You know, Sam said, I, 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 we plan things. We plan things that matter. We don't want to run out of money, so we budget. We want to be sure that we have good vacation time and good rest, so we plan that vacation time. We want to be sure that in our retirement years, we don't run out of uh, money before, uh, run out of month before we run out of money or vice versa. We deal with those things. Yet when it comes to the things of God, we don't plan. And then I wonder... All of this planning for things that will one day be like a vapor, and then one day we may stand before God with empty hands, having never made preparation to invest in individuals that they might come to Jesus. And guess what? It's not always easy to reach people for Christ. In fact, it's said that a person must be contacted seven times before following Jesus. So you might visit someone at the home. You might see them at Millbrook. You might do this. You might serve. You might go and do something for that person. And the third time, the fourth time, maybe not. And on average, it's seven. That means for every one that, that it's one, that there's going to be somebody else that's going to be about number 13. And, and so we have to persevere. We have to be determined. And if we make the effort, it's not a failure. God calls us to sow the seeds. He's the one that gives the harvest. And so we must be prepared. We must plan to lead people to know Jesus. And it begins by praying and looking for ways to show them Jesus. But I want you to see a final truth. They showed determination by following through with their plan. They didn't just sit back 100 yards, look at the say, scenery and say, you know what we need to do? We can't get in that crowd. We can't get in the door. You know what we need to do? We need to sort of navigate around. We need to find where the ladder is. And so they're sitting there. They're contemplating. They're determining. They're calculating how can we do this. But it wasn't enough to have a plan. Plans don't win people to Christ. Plans marked by action, empowered by the Holy Spirit, do that. There are two men you probably will not recognize their name, but you'll recognize their creation, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster lived in the early 1900s, and they created the superhero Superman, that character. Uh, the two men, um, they worked together and they developed this uh, superhero and it, they were creative in it, but their story is a sad account and I read about it this past week in Bad Days in History. A man named Michael Farquhar uh, wrote that on March 1st, 1938, Siegel and Schuster determined to sell the rights to Superman for $130. Each man put $65 in his pocket and walked away. 75 years later, the Superman enterprise was valued to be $3 billion. I wouldn't have wanted to be their great-grandchildren. The two man, men, they had a plan, and it was a brilliant strategy. But they didn't stick with it long enough to see it through. You know what happens many times in our lives? We'll have desires. We, 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 we want to see people come to Christ. We'll even make an effort. But then if it doesn't happen just right, we'll sort of give up before God is ready to do a great work. And so planning is not enough. The men had a plan. And, and bringing one to Jesus for us, there's a plan, there's praying, there's invitation, there's testimony, there's gospel sharing. But in doing that, we don't need to give up too early. It takes determination. In the book of Proverbs, one of the smallest of creatures, the ant, is commended. And in Proverbs, God's word says, go to the ant and observe. I was thinking about the work of the ant. You've ever seen an ant colony. The two things, determined industriousness and cooperation. 
They're all working together. And I thought, what if the church did that? What if we all worked and there was a determination and we all worked together? So maybe someone's inviting someone to come to church and they take that part, that part of the plan. Someone else in the church knows that they, and they're sitting across the church while the word is being preached and they're praying. And someone else says, well, you know what? These people are doing that. Let me maybe go and help this person clean their house or maybe they're doing a fix-it project let me do that and all of these things are working together in determined work that people might get saved we're not seeing enough people being saved through the ministry of this church and it really starts right here it starts in the pulpit we've got to be better we're all going to stand before God one day and he's going to say what about that worker you said, well, I was doing this. You know, I felt like I needed to do that. The tyranny of the urgent replaces what's important. Let's make no mistake, it's God who does the saving. But are we planting the seeds? We ought to be doing the work. Jesus said, uh, the harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. For those of us who are here today, if you're saved, do you realize that God could have saved you and taken you to be with him just that moment? He could have done it. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was enough. You could have been saved, and he could have said, he could have just transported you. Maybe you're going through a difficulty now. Maybe you're going through challenges. Maybe life has been long. There have been ups and downs, and you've said, uh, God, uh, what's going on here? You're thinking through your own avenue. God saved you to keep you here for a purpose. One of my good friends, David Landreth, was a tremendous pastor. His church, when he died at the age of 52, had 7,000 members. And God took him to be with him. His work was done. He, he loved the Lord and he served 7,000. It wasn't members. It was 7,000 in attendance every day. And sometimes I've thought, Lord, you've kept me here. Here's a guy that was reaching 7,000 people and his time had been completed and you took him to be with you. And every time I think about that, I come to the conclusion and the conviction, God, you've kept me here because there's more for me to do. And there's more for you to do. In Philippians 1, Paul speaks of his desire to go to heaven to be with Christ, which he said is better by far. Yet he said in the same uh, context, it is more needful for you, church at Philippi, that I stay, that I not go to be in heaven. And so he understood God had a ministry for him, specifically toward the Philippians, discipleship for the church. But we understand, too, the heart of Paul, that it was to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here to invest in God's kingdom. We need to live life on purpose and we need the determination, which is the conviction based on the calculation that Christ is the answer to people's needs. And we need to follow that with the determination from the heart that we'll do what is needed. I was reading a prayer this morning. I had not planned on sharing this, one of my dad's favorite Christian writers was Watchman Nee. When I was young, he kept saying, Watchman Nee, Watchman Nee. And I, and I began to, after my dad passed, actually, I began to read more of this great uh, Chinese believer in the Lord, a tremendous writer, one of the great Christian authors of the last 150 or so years. And Watchman Nee offered a prayer, and and I, I, I typed it out to put in this little book, and he said this, Oh God, I'm before you today as unable and feeble and unchanged as before. But God, I thank you because you are still my life, my holiness, and my victory. I believe during the entire day ahead that you will live out your life in me. I praise and thank you for all is your grace, all is done by your son. Let's pray. Father, as we heard this prayer of a great spiritual giant, Lord, may it be our prayer that during this entire day ahead and then tomorrow would the prayer be the same, that you would live out your life in us. And Lord, if you live out your life in us, it will be a magnet 
to draw people to you. Lord, forgive us for our neglect in this spiritual discipline of reaching people for you. But Lord, we do not want to walk in guilt. We want to walk in the freedom of Christ, resolved that from this point forward, we'll have eyes to see the determination of these four men, indeed these five, to do what is needed, Lord, to get the gospel message to people. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken to you today.